Father, hallowed be your name. Reigning high in heaven, receive our grateful praise. Who is like you, Jesus, the Son most glorious, the fullness of the Godhead who came in flesh for us. Savior, Lord Jesus, Hallowed be your name, risen now in power, the Lamb for sinners slain. Who is like you, Spirit, our comfort from? above you draw us to the Savior reveal the Father's love Spirit oh Spirit hallowed be your name fount of living Water, come fill our hearts again. God, there's no one like you, for who can bear the sight? Clothed in glory of splendor, in holy burning lights oh god our god who was and is to come father son and spirit most holy three in one most holy three in one. Most holy three in one. My Jesus. Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine, for Thee all the follies of sin I resign, my gracious Redeemer, my Savior, our if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me. Love 
life I will love Thee in death And praise Thee as long as Thou lendest me breath And sing when the death do Lies cold on my brow If ever I love Thee, my Jesus In mansions of glory and endless delights, I'll ever adore Thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow if ever I love thee my Jesus tis now Good morning and welcome to our Pepperell Christian Fellowship worship service for Sunday, May 24, 2020. It's great to have you with us and I imagine many of you in your living rooms, in your homes around this region, maybe just logging on now. So if you're coming on, welcome. We're glad you're with us. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts toward God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 3, 16, 17. Those are our fighter verses for this week. And several things stand out to me in those verses. First of all, the call for thankfulness is mentioned twice in just two verses. It must be very important to Paul. He says, with thankfulness in your hearts to God, and then he says, giving thanks to God the Father through Jesus. So are we cultivating a thankfulness? I pray this morning, even through this service, we will. Also, the importance of singing, and not just individual singing, but corporate singing, gathered singing. He says, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing, the way we do that is singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I'm so glad we've been able to add singing back into this live stream service because even though we're not doing it directly to one another, it's happening. We can imagine it. We know it's happening around this region as we sing in our own homes. I can't wait for the day, Lord willing, two weeks from this morning when we can sing to one another again. And then finally, I'm struck by Paul's admonition, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Wow, everything. That's a test for us. Can we do the things we do each day, each week, in the name of the Lord Jesus? If we can't do them in the name of the Lord Jesus, we probably shouldn't be doing them. And this can transform, this is an elixir that can transform everything we do into an act of worship. So we're glad you're with us. I pray that even this morning, we will teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, that we will sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts toward God. Glad you're with us. If you're just coming on now, uh, we're glad to have you along on this live stream for Sunday, May 24. We will be coming to the Lord's Supper later in this service, so I want to invite you to prepare your communion elements now so that you're not scrambling when we come to that time at the end of the service. And as importantly, please be preparing your hearts to come to the Lord's table with the rest of our brothers and sisters as part of this live stream service. We will have an opportunity in just a moment to confess our sin to God and to receive gospel assurance from God. Also a reminder to please print your worship guide 
now, either print it or have it on a screen near you so that uh, you can read that responsive reading with us in just a moment, and you can uh, know the words of the songs we're going to be singing and see the sermon points. Several things to thank God for. Uh, first of all, at our all-church gathering this past Monday, which was our first ever all-church gathering on Zoom, um, our congregation unanimously appointed Lori Close and Gavin Price-Lewis as deacons, and we're thrilled, uh, thankful to God for the provision of those two new deacons. We unanimously appointed Bob Shute to a second term as elder, and we unanimously appointed Morris Eastwick to a first term as elder. And we do thank God for the provision of these leaders. It's a sign of his grace to us as a church. We will pray for them later in the service. Also this past week, Marie Bearer began working as our part-time church accountant, and we're very thankful to have her now on our church staff. Ed Marino has been serving us very well in this role, and he's expressed a desire to retire from it. So he's going to continue on for the coming months, training Marie to eventually replace him. And we are very thankful for Ed's faithful work over the years. We are excited to welcome Marie to our staff team. So congratulations to you, Marie. As most of you now know, we received good news this past Monday from Governor Charlie Baker uh, that he is allowing churches now in Massachusetts to be in the first wave of those who are regathering. And I hope you received a letter from the PCF elders that was sent out this past week. If not, it's posted on our website. We have currently got a team of folks working hard on a re-entry plan uh, so that we can have our first live in-person Sunday services in quite a while at 8.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. on Sunday, June 7, two weeks from today. We will be seeking to comply with all of Governor Baker's directives in order to ensure that that is as safe as possible for all those who would like to join us on June 7. For those not able to be here with us in person on June 7 and for some time to come, we will continue this live stream in the months to come, uh, though the time of the live stream will change either to 8.30 or 11 a.m. We haven't decided which one of those yet. Please look for another letter from the elders this week, and that's going to give you more details of our plan for regathering in person on Sunday mornings. I am really looking forward to seeing you, to seeing those of you who are able to be here with us. Can't wait to see you. Finally, a heads up, we will not meet for our regular Monday evening prayer and encouragement time tomorrow evening because it's Memorial Day, uh, but we will resume that prayer time again the following Monday. Now, I want to invite you to turn to your worship guide for the responsive reading that we're going to share together as our call to worship. So wherever you are, um, just invite you to take that, that worship guide out. And as we come into the presence of a holy God, it's important to confess our sin and to hear words of gospel assurance. I invite you now to take a quiet moment for personal confession of sin, reflect on the holiness of God, and confess your sin to him. And then in just a moment, we'll speak these words of corporate confession together. So I invite you, in your own heart, to confess your sin to our holy God. And now we will confess our sin together. Let's read together the words of the people in this responsive reading. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. 
And now hear these words of assurance. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Psalm 103. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so glad to be gathered here this morning. We are so glad to be in your presence, though we're not in one another's presence. And we're glad because this is love. Not that we've loved you, but that you've loved us and you've given your Son as a propitiation for our sin. Lord, what a mystery that you would give your Son in order to avert your own wrath. You are just and you are love. And at the cross, your love and your justice meet. And at the cross, a way of salvation is open for us. So we can confess our sin and we can know that it's forgiven, that your wrath is satisfied, that our sin is paid, and that we are right with you forever. And that puts a song in our hearts and on our lips. I pray as we make much of you now, as we sing, oh God, Holy Spirit, you'd fill us and allow us to overflow so that all the universe will hear our praise of our wise and just and loving God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God, our Father, full of power, Maker of the heavens, maker of the world, for me all things seen and unseen, truly the Almighty, beyond all. Father, Spirit, Son, this is our God. We believe forever He will reign. Let the church proclaim this is our God. Jesus sent to save us, born unto a virgin, lived a perfect life, greatly suffered, dying for us. From the grave he's risen, seated now on high, holy is his name. We be The Lord our God is one, Father, Spirit, Son, this is our God. We believe forever He will reign, let the church proclaim this is our God. Jesus will come back again. To judge the living and the dead Usher in the age to come Let everyone sing Amen Jesus will come back again 
to judge the living and the dead. Usher in the age to come, let everyone sing Amen. Let everyone sing Amen. Spirit, Holy One, in glory, speaking through the prophets, empowering the church. Life is given by and through Him, with the Son and Father, worshipped and adored. Holy is His name. We believe the Lord our God is one, Father, Spirit, Son, this is our God. We believe forever He will reign, let the church proclaim this is our God. O God of unsearchable greatness, righteous judge, before you we are nothing but vanity, iniquity. We are fading, withering, perishing. Our sin has forfeited your favor, stripped us of your image, banished us from your presence, exposed us to the curse of the law. We cannot deliver ourselves and therefore we despair. However, provision is found in you, for without our merit or desire, you devised an everlasting plan consistent with your perfections, your holiness, your justice. You chose to save us through your Holy Son rather than to pour out your holy wrath May we, convinced and despairing sinners, find Jesus as the only means of our salvation. His death, the center of all relief, the source of all gospel blessings. Help us to retreat to his cross and by it be crucified to the world and in it find deepest humiliation the motive of self-denial, grace for active benevolence, faith to grasp eternal life, hope to lift up our heads, love to bind us forever to him who died and rose from the grave for us. Amen. What a Savior. Eternal Word made flesh was He, the promised prophets long to see. Jesus Christ, our mystery, hallelujah, what a Savior. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. shame and scoffing root in my place condemned he stood 
sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was He. Full atonement can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven, exalted high. Hallelujah, what a Savior. And when he comes, our glorious King. All his ransomed home to bring. Then anew this song will sing. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy See, Let's sing that again. Worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. and rainbows of living color flashes of lightning rolls of thunder blessing and honor strength and glory and power be to you the only wise king holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Filled 
with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. What's our name? Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. So we thank you, Heavenly Father, Holy God, the one before whom we will bow and worship all our days, eternity, endless time. We bless and thank and praise you, and that you would be a perfectly holy God, and yet so gracious and kind to us, amazes us. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for drawing us into relationship with yourself and forgiving our sin and clothing us with Christ's righteousness. And we thank you for the blessings upon blessings upon blessings on top of that. Father, we thank you specifically for your great goodness to us as a church. We thank you for Gavin Price Lewis and Lori Close as new deacons and Bob Shute and Morris Eastwick as elders and for Marie Bearer as she's coming on staff. And we thank you for each of these leaders. We pray that they will live out the commands of Romans 12, 9 through 13. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Father, thank you for these men and women, these gifts to our church. May they be filled with your spirit so they can obey you and make much of you among us. We pray for all of our elders and deacons and church staff, and we ask your blessing and strength and energy and wisdom for them. We pray that whatever they do, in word or deed, they will do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We pray, Father, for churches and church leaders around the world as they consider the possibility of regathering And as they make difficult decisions, we pray that you will give us and every church much grace for one another in our differences, our different instincts and different perspectives. Father, would you give your your people wisdom and courage and zeal for your name? And we thank you for this directive we've received from Governor Baker that we can gather again. Um, I pray that you'll give us wisdom, especially for the team who's planning the regathering for Sunday, June 7. Lord, give us wisdom and energy and uh, the ability to plan well and prepare and communicate so that we are safe, all those who gather again two weeks from this morning. 
And Lord, I pray that all of us, whether we continue on this live stream or whether we come back here in person, will be deeply united in faith before you. We grieve with those who grieve. And so this morning, Father, we grieve with Phil Duquette and his daughter Olivia as they grieve the loss of Phil's wife, Michelle, two days ago. We pray for Phil and Olivia that you will strengthen and help them. Pray that you'll make Phil strong in faith as he makes plans for a funeral. Lord, as he grieves the loss of his wife in the days and weeks and months ahead, oh God, be gracious to Phil. Allow us as a church family to come around him and Olivia. We pray for Barbara Fleming's 22-year-old niece, Leah, with COVID-19 in the hospital with her breathing affected and a fast heart rate. And we pray, Lord, that you would heal her. Even right now, heal Leah, we pray, and give peace to her family. May the gospel be known and cherished in that family. Lord, for all those who are sick, for all those who are struggling, anxious, depressed, afraid, we pray the peace of Christ. And now, Lord, Speak to us through your word and at the table. We thank you for these dual graces. We thank you that we can hear you through your word and we can experience you at your table. This is amazing that you would speak to us and that you would show us hospitality as we eat your supper. So come, I pray for an anointing upon Pastor Jeff as he preaches your word. You give him freedom and power And give us attention wherever we are now to hear that word, to receive it, and to apply it to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to add my good morning to all of you, wherever you're watching from, uh, whether you're in your living room, on a couch, on chairs, uh, on the floor, all spread out there, wherever you are at. Uh, Welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. And this morning we're diving back into uh, God's Word, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 to 11. You'll want to grab a Bible, uh, whether that's a a paper copy or electronic, uh, whatever you prefer. But bring that and turn with me to Isaiah 51, uh, because it's important that you see God's Word for yourselves. And also that you test my words against what you see there in God's word. I want to quickly orient us to where we've been uh, in the book of Isaiah. The last couple of sections in Isaiah, I've been seeing this building, or we've been seeing this building progression of hope for God's people. We began seeing that progression two weeks ago when we talked about the good news that God is willing to save his people Uh, In spite of all their bad actions, in spite of their unfaithfulness to him, their broken promises to him, God is going to keep his promise and he is going to be faithful to save his people. He is still willing to save his people because that is his promise. And then that was two weeks ago. Then last week we saw God's means of his salvation. That God would save his people by means of his perfect servant. There will be one that he sends to rescue the many. And those two weeks were the build up to this week. uh, When we're going to talk and look at the completeness of God's coming salvation. This has been building up. God is willing. God is able. He has the means to And he is going to save his people. Isaiah is going to give us this amazing picture of just the salvation that is coming. He's going to restore joy to his people. God's going to bring about comfort to his people. And we've had, up to this point, we've just seen that they have been afflicted. They've been captured. They've been conquered by the Babylonians. And they are in captivity. And so their affliction is great. And though we already have seen that, that that affliction was actually brought on by the hand of God, we had a memory verse just a week ago that told us that God does not afflict from the heart. 
It's not his heart to afflict, though he will use that, he will use that affliction that he brings on his people to bring about his purposes for his people. And in this case, a major purpose is to produce a remnant from Israel, people devoted to trusting in the Lord. So what will God's salvation look looks like? Isaiah gives us three joy-producing aspects of God's coming salvation. Amazingly, God's going to powerfully reverse and transform not only their current circumstances, which would be probably good in its own right, but there's coming a time when he'll be transforming everything they knew to be true, everything that they know to be true about the world. You'll see in the outline of those, those three aspects of God's coming salvation summarized in your worship guide. Uh, so if you have your worship guide, feel free to jot notes there uh, and help you to follow along. Uh, the three things that will bring about or will be brought about through God's salvation are from barrenness will spring forth life. From the things they know are temporary, he's going to bring about that which is everlasting From their captivity, he's going to bring about freedom for his people. So from barrenness to life, from temporary to everlasting, from captivity to freedom, everything will be transformed. What an incredible promise. What an incredible set of promises to us. And as we'll point out, some of these promises will be fulfilled in part when the Babylonians are conquered, Israel's enemy, They're going to be conquered by King Cyrus in 539 AD when the Israelites will be freed. Much of these promises, we'll see, that will be realized later through Jesus while he is on earth. And some have yet to be consummated and won't be completed until Jesus' return. And so we're waiting in expectation for those portions. And I'll challenge you at home as we read. We're going to read this passage together. Uh, And see if you can discern which of these aspects of God's salvation were fulfilled in the past, are being fulfilled now, and those that will be future promises for God's people. So follow along with me, Isaiah 50, starting in verse 1. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. And to the quarry from which you were dug, look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion, he comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord." Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whom, whose heart is my law. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings. For the moth will eat them, They'll eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is God's 
word to us. Before we look at those three aspects of God's salvation, it's really important for us to understand who God is talking to in this passage. Is it all of Israel? Is it all peoples? Is it a subset of Israel? We've mentioned the remnant that God is preserving. It's actually really clear from the way God addresses them that this, who this is addressing. And so verse 1, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. He goes on to say, look at the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. In other words, this is a particular group that has been carved out from a bigger rock, dug up from the hole for God's purposes, and they are the ones who are seeking God. That's who he's talking to. Verse 4 continues, God addresses this group as my people, my nation. Again, jump down to verse 7, he calls to you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. And lastly, in verse 11, God, God calls them the ransom of the Lord, those who will be redeemed. God is clearly speaking to those out of the nation of Israel that he can truly call his own. He is talking to the remnant that he is preserving for himself. In Romans 9.27, the Apostle Paul quotes, ironically, Isaiah 10.22 and 23, for though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, that's their promise to Abraham, only a remnant of them will return. This is God's aim to preserve a righteous people for himself. We also get from those verses this sense that this is extremely important. This is an extremely important message for God's people. Notice he says, verse 1, listen to me. Give attention in verse 4. Verse 7, listen to me. This is meant to grab their attention. It's meant to grab our attention now. So what will God's salvation bring about? The first aspect of God's salvation that we are given is from barrenness, He will bring life. It's His first promise of His salvation And so one of the great catastrophes of the nation of Israel as a result of being conquered by the Babylonians was uh, was their luscious green fields where her sheep would graze, the the abundant grape orchards, the, the beautiful flowers that decorated the landscape. All of it was just plundered and destroyed and laid sitting there just barren, unfruitful. It was laid waste. God speaking through the prophet Isaiah to the remnant of Israel is saying, listen to me, there is a day coming when I will restore your land and make it overflow with fruitfulness once again. Verse 3, if you jump there for a moment, says, for the Lord comforts Zion, he comforts her waste places. He will bring them back from desolation into a land that is not slightly improved, but he goes on to say that he will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. He will restore the land back to the beauty of God's original creation. He will make her perfect again, bursting with abundant fruitfulness, beauty, and productivity. And so what proof is there that God will make good on this unbelievable promise. He says in verse 2, that they are to look to their forefather Abraham and his wife Sarah to see that he has done this type of restoration project before. Um, We are people who love restoration. We love to see restoration accomplished I know when I'm looking through uh, Netflix for something to watch, I'm struck by those shows that bring something from nothing. Uh, I, I love watching shows that things like they restore vintage cars that look like a heap of rust and bring them to these amazing vehicles that, that people pay tens of thousands of dollars for. Or someone that brings beauty from people throwing away their items and restores them and brings them to fruitfulness again. 
some of the treasures that we see being refurbished for people. And there's countless home improvement shows. Why are we drawn to these? There's so many. There's a channel and many channels now that you can watch home improvement, whether your favorite is This Old House or Fixer Upper. We love these shows because we're drawn to restoration. We love to see things restored back to their glory. And so that's a, I take that as God has hardwired us that way to long for restoration. And so back to Abraham and Sarah. You'll remember that Sarah was barren, childless, into her 90s. Uh, and God made a promise to Abraham and Sarah that he would, Abraham would be the father of many nations. And as he says here in the second part of the verse, he, he was but one, meaning Abraham was just one guy when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. Back to that father of many nations. The point being that just as Sarah was comforted when God made good on his promise, though she was barren even into her 90s, God brought fruitfulness to her womb. So too, God will bring life Again, from Israel's own land, her barren wasteland will again be fruitful. And so Israel's land, physical land being restored is a beautiful thing. We just said we long to see these things happen. But let's put together some of these pieces of this story that's been building. Given that God began this section by addressing the remnant specifically, the true believers in Israel, and also given his proof of making good on his promise points us back to Abraham, the one who believed, trusted in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, it's clear here that we're not just talking about making the physical land fruitful and filled with a bunch of people. But out of spiritual desolate Israel, God is also redeeming, preserving, restoring a remnant who will produce more spiritual people, spiritually fruitful people, a nation of people who will trust in the Lord. So he cares about the physical and also the spiritual, but all will be restored and renewed. Add to that, given that the chapter before this was all about God's coming servant who will bring about salvation uh, to his people. I think it's crystal clear we are supposed to make the obvious connection here between the life that God is bringing about in physical and spiritual barrenness of Israel and the salvation, the spiritual life that Jesus brings about out of the spiritual barrenness of all people, of all nations out of the one many sons will be brought to glory jesus is that one that perfect servant we've been talking about and so when god references eden in this passage god is not only interested in restoring the physicality of of eden but the perfect relationship man had with god in that garden so he's, he's bringing the physical and spiritual relationship back to God. All will be restored in right relationship through his servant. This is God's ultimate task. This is what Jesus, God's perfect servant, does for his people. God cares, again, cares about physical and spiritual salvation. All will be brought to restoration. Think about what Jesus did in his own ministry on earth. He healed the ailments of the people and he forgave the sins of the people. Both were signs of the coming kingdom of God when all will be restored and made right. The curse of sin had a negative impact on every aspect of creation. The physical as much as the spiritual and Jesus came to bring complete restoration to all creation of which we are part of. But this presents us with a question that we need to answer. Not to bring this down, but if God restores Israel's homeland as he's promising, if we're thinking as readers in Isaiah's time, and we're hearing this future restoration of the land, won't there be, in fact, other enemies that come up against us? Won't they, won't they come and destroy again? And in, that, in fact, that's what the reality of where 
Israel is situated physically, they're smack dab in the middle of all these greater nations that over the years would try to conquer one another and they would gobble up these little nations all around them to be part of their kingdom. And so on repeat, we'll see this throughout Israel's history. They're conquered again and again and again. So is, is God's promise for them, is it, is it incomplete in some way? And I hope our gut instinct is to say no, but, but what is the reason for that? The reason is because there is even more to God's perfect salvation. It's broader, it's bigger. It's even further reaching than just the restoration of land or even restoration of the hearts of the people. We're going to talk about our second point if you're following along in your guide. God's coming salvation will bring about from all the things that are temporary, all the things we know that are temporary, He will bring about that which is everlasting. And so what temporary things are we talking about? First, Israel's enemies are temporary. Jump down to verse 7. God makes it clear that Israel need not fear the reproach of man or be dismayed at the revilings of their enemies. Why? Because those enemies are temporary. Moths will eat them like a garment and the worm will eat them like wool. First of all, don't worry. They're not going to last forever. They will not be your enemies forever. In, in high school, I had an English teacher that was near retirement age, and it was clear to all of us teenagers, at least, that uh, he was a really bitter man, uh, and maybe retirement should have been closer than he was planning. But in fact, he, he, to prove that point uh, for this man, he would read the newspaper every day, uh, specifically looking for the name of this man who wronged him years and years ago. He was looking to that paper to see in the obituary to see if this man's name was in there. Uh, he was just bitter at this man had taken from, I've never heard the story completely, he's taken something from him. He wronged him in a way that he could not Forgive, And is that what we're supposed to look towards? Is that what this passage is saying? And hopefully we say, of course not. It can't be. It can't be that, that we're just waiting for our enemies to die. And that's not what we're saying. They're not only to be comforted by the fact that their enemies won't live forever, meaning they, they won't have these enemies forever. And that's true. But there's also things that God is going to do with their enemies And he's going to do one of two things to their enemies. One, he's either going to save them too, or he's going to bring about his justice. Those are the two possibilities for their enemies. I see that in the second half of verse 4 and verse 5. It says, God's righteousness will draw near. His salvation has gone out. His arm will judge the peoples. Whenever we see the term, the peoples, we know it's another term for the nations, the, the nations, many of which are Israel's enemies. Even more clear that the coastlands are mentioned here. Uh, we had said a couple weeks ago that refers to the Babylonians, one of their enemies right now that is front and center. They will hope for God's deliverance and his mighty arm. So their enemies will either become God's people or they will receive his judgment. Either way, God is going to deal with him. God is their judge. We are not their judge. And God is going to deal with our enemies the same way. Do we have enemies that persecute us for trusting in Christ? Of course we do. Jesus said that we will, they will hate us because they hated him. But he calls us to love our enemies. We should actually seek their salvation. So be comforted in all these things. God God is going to bring your enemies to himself. That's what we are to pray for. And if not, if they will not repent and turn to him, they will be judged by God, the perfect judge. The biggest thing is our, our biggest enemy, Satan. Jesus has already defeated his power and taken care of him, and he will take care of him permanently when he returns. He will crush the serpent. This is all part of God's permanent salvation for his people. 
The second thing that is temporary that is brought to everlasting likely comes as more of a surprise to us. Uh, We get that surprise in verse 6. In verse 6, God tells them to look to the heavens and the earth. It says, the heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment. Remember what we said at the beginning of our time together this morning. Some of these promises will be fulfilled in part when Babylon, the Babylonians are conquered by King Cyrus. Much of this is realized through Jesus. And some of it will be consummated when Jesus returns. This is one of those that will not be realized completely until Jesus returns. Isaiah later on in going into chapter 65 and 66 talks about a new heavens and a new earth. That God is promising to create this new heavens and new earth. Uh, The apostle Peter picks up on that promise in 2 Peter 3.13. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Finally, in Revelation, God gives the apostle John, he gives him a vision of this. We were there. Then I, John, saw a new heaven, a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Verse 3 of that passage says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. This is the hope of all of us who believe in Christ that we will one day be raised in bodily form just like Jesus was and live with him in the new heavens and new earth forever. The new heavens, new earth will in some ways be like what we know now. In some ways, there'll be some similarities, but completely perfected. Earth will be completely perfected when heaven and earth are combined in the new heavens, new earth. Verse 11 of our passage gives us a a picture of what this will look like. Actually, a, a direct quote from Isaiah, previous chapter, Isaiah 35 says, and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. New Testament language, Revelation 21.4, we read, He will wipe away every tear from your eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, no crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So what is the permanent aspect of this new heavens and the earth? The end of verse 6, my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Then again in verse 8, my righteousness will be forever. Similar language, my righteousness will be forever, my salvation to all generations. What could bring Israel more comfort and joy? What could bring us more comfort and joy than to know that God's salvation will result in permanent deliverance of us from our sickness, from sin, from our enemy, from even Satan, from even death itself? We are delivered from all of that. Once and for all, we get to experience within, without any hindrance to our relationship with God and being in His glory and partaking in His righteousness for all eternity. This is true. This is God's Word, His promise to them, to us today. We're to take joy and comfort in this. If you are God's people, if you've been saved by Jesus Christ, this is a joy. This is our hope. This is, should get our hearts excited that we give God thanks for this. And to all of it, we say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We're ready. We are ready for him to return and bring all things back to the way they should be. And this is, in fact, pretty much how Isaiah responds to God on behalf of the people in the last three verses of our chapter. Verse 9, awake, awake. He's talking to God on behalf of the people. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the days long ago. Israel hadn't received this type of deliverance from the days, since the days of the exodus out of Egypt. 
At the end of this verse, we see Rahab is mentioned and the, the dragon, and there's, there probably brings up about some confusion for us, but those two terms are referring back to God's enemy, specifically Egypt. That, is, that was God's people's biggest enemy of the past, Egypt. And so Isaiah is going to bring out, bring our minds back to the Exodus and the Israelites bringing out of this and remembering God's mighty power, his faithfulness to his people, his strength that he's displayed in the past. And this is a sure guarantee of God's future deliverance, his salvation in the future. Let's pick back up in verse 10 of our passage. Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? This was God, obviously referring to Egypt and Pharaoh, that God had brought Israel out of Egypt. The armies chased them. They went into the Red Sea, which God parted for them so they could pass on miraculously dry land and then when Pharaoh and his army come in God brings back the waters to rage over them and destroy Israel's enemy this is of course mentioned in as an event in Israel's past for that guarantee of future deliverance but it also in from Isaiah's standpoint or Isaiah's time this is a reference to a future promise that will come to God's people in Luke 4, we read this story of Jesus, this account of Jesus coming back to his hometown of Nazareth. And at the temple, they, they hand him a scroll of Isaiah. And he, Jesus finds Isaiah 61 and reads the first two verses from the scroll. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus casually rolls up the scroll, sits down, and then says to him, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is the greater exodus promised here. Jesus is the one who is going to free the captives, free us, open the sight, make the sight of the blind return, that we can see Jesus and as God's salvation for his people, that we can see that in Jesus is forgiveness for our sins, that he will wipe away all the wrath of God, put aside the wrath of God that we deserve and he will save us out of the bondage even though it's our own sin that holds us bondage and captivity. And so the Israelites were saved in the exodus from physical death at Egypt's hand but Jesus comes that we might be set free from our greater foe, sin and Satan and death in order that he will save us from spiritual death forever. Do you need comfort today? Do you need joy restored today? Do you long, as we all do, for for restoration of all that's broken in you or even broken in the world? Do you look for a restoration of all of this? The promise is that Jesus can bring from your barren heart, he can bring life. He's going to bring justice upon all that we see that is temporary and that his salvation and his righteousness will stand forever. There's nothing that can be taken away from us. As a captive, he can set you free. The salvation that God offers us through Christ is 100% complete. There is nothing it lacks. We are restored and saved in every single aspect, every way you could imagine. As the promise, the fullness of God's salvation for his people. And so if you haven't trusted in Christ, this is an opportunity to consider God's free offer of salvation by trusting in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you're trusting in Christ, this is an opportunity for us to remember the amazing scope, the completeness, the breadth of our salvation in Christ. 
that is a free gift to us? Do we know the gift that has been given to us in saving us? All those who proclaim Jesus as Savior, we can rejoice that just like Isaiah ends this passage with, we can rejoice with Israel and say, and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. All of this is brought about by Jesus and his mighty salvation for his people. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, what an amazing salvation that you have purchased for us on the cross. Lord, we will remember and recount what you've done for us when we come to the table in a moment. Lord, that your salvation is complete and sure and it is beyond compare to anything. Lord, I pray that through your words from the pages of Isaiah this morning, that you will bring joy and comfort to your people this morning, for this day, for this week, that it would restore hope until you return. That the salvation you guarantee us will sustain us when we are weary, strengthen us when we feel like giving up, motivate us to live a life of loving you in obedience to your word and loving one another as a testament to our love that we've experienced through you. Lord, for those who haven't given their life to Christ, Lord, we pray, Lord, that they would consider for a moment this amazing offer of salvation from God through Jesus. And Lord, it, it's not that we don't, deserve, we don't deserve any of it. It's all grace. We don't need to work towards it. There's not seven steps to get to you. There's no ritual that will take its place. It's all trusting in the name of Jesus. Pray that some watching this morning would do that, would put their trust in Jesus and that they would celebrate with us this table, this communion that we're going to celebrate. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. We give you all honor and glory and all honor and glory and power are yours forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're now going to go to the table of communion, uh, which was instituted, it was taught by Jesus himself in order that we would remember and give thanks and celebrate God's salvation that has been brought through the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And so this is a, a somber celebration for the believers in Jesus. Those who profess Jesus as Savior, all of you who are watching this live stream who profess Jesus as Lord, this is for you. This is the table meant for us to remember God's salvation. And if you're joining us this morning and you're not a believer, I want to give you one more opportunity before we go to the table to make yourself right by coming before the Lord and admitting you are a sinner in need of salvation. You need forgiveness. And Jesus is the only way to receive that forgiveness for your sins. And if you do that this morning, you can join us in this celebration and so in this, we are remembering that Jesus died for us. And, I, and we encourage you to confess before the Lord, this is, this is nothing I deserve, Lord, but you have lavished grace upon grace upon me. Let's remember the great cost, but the joy that it has brought to our hearts. This is also a good time to remember as we're, we're scattered about taking this supper, that, that at the cross, Christ purchased unity for his church, for his people. He established the church and purchased unity. We are united around the gospel. And so we're spread out all over this region, but we are united in heart in the love of Christ. And in extending that love for one another as a testimony to the fact that God's grace, his love, is working in our hearts. So we also remember that this good meal nourishes our, 
our physical bodies like a good meal does, but Christ's body given for us is to, we're to partake in, it nourishes our souls. We are sustained by abiding in Christ. And this is a picture of Christ abiding in us and us abiding in Christ. We also affirm our faith again here at the table. Let the bread and the cup remind us of the sacrifice that made us children of God. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Lord, we are so grateful for your sacrificial love for us. Lord, that drove you to and kept you on the cross. You allowed yourself to be betrayed, allowed your body to be broken. And not for a nameless people. You know us so intimately that you know our thoughts and our motives. You know our hearts. Yet you loved us enough to die for us anyway. Lord, you paid the price to set us free, even though it was our own sin that kept us in bondage, even though there is nothing in us that would merit that you give yourself for us. We celebrate that you extended your lavish free grace towards us anyway. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It was in the same way also that Jesus took the cup After supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Lord Jesus, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, Lord, we proclaim your death until the day you return. And Lord, we declare that your death was our, our triumph over sin, Satan, and death itself. Lord, with joy we declare your triumph was also our victory. And Lord, in you we also claim victory over sin, death, and our enemy. Lord, we declare in your death, Lord, that sin no longer binds us. Satan cannot hold us captive. We no longer are fearful of death, and we long to see you, our living Savior. We long to see the salvation, our salvation realized completely when we see you face to face, Lord. Lord, thank you for your great sacrifice for each one of us. Thank you for the joy it is to be your people Saved, restored, being restored. We love you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Now receive the benediction. May the salvation of the Lord continue to bring you comfort and joy today. And also hope for the tomorrow that will last forever with the Lord. Go in peace and spread the gospel.